Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Ten. Oliver becomes better acquainted with the characters of his new associates, and purchases experience at a high price, being a short but very important chapter in this history. For many days, Oliver remained in the Jew's room, picking the marks out of the pocket handkerchief, of which a great number were brought home, and sometimes taking part in the game already described, which the two boys and the Jew played regularly every morning. At length, he began to languish for fresh air, and took many occasions of earnestly entreating the old gentleman to allow him to go out to work with his two companions. Oliver was rendered the more anxious to be actively employed by what he had seen of the stern morality of the old gentleman's character. Whenever the Dodger or Charlie Bates came home at night, empty-handed, he would expatiate with great vehemence on the misery of idle and lazy habits, and would enforce upon them the necessity of an active life by sending them supperless to bed. On one occasion, indeed, he even went so far as to knock them both down a flight of stairs, but this was carrying out his virtuous precepts to an unusual extent. At length, one morning, Oliver obtained the permission he had so eagerly sought. There had been no handkerchiefs to work upon for two or three days, and the dinners had been rather meagre. Perhaps these were reasons for the old gentleman's giving his assent. But, whether they were or no, he told Oliver he might go, and placed him under the joint guardianship of Charlie Bates and his friend the Dodger. The three boys sallied out, the Dodger with his coat sleeves tucked up, and his hat cocked as usual, Master Bates sauntering along with his hands in his pockets, and Oliver between them, wondering where they were going, and what branch of manufacture he would be instructed in first. The pace at which they went was such a very lazy, ill-looking saunter, that Oliver soon began to think his companions were going to deceive the old gentleman by not going to work at all. The Dodger had a vicious propensity, too, of pulling the caps from the heads of small boys, and tossing them down areas, while Charlie Bates exhibited some very loose notions concerning the rights of property, by pilfering diverse apples and onions from the stalls at the kennel sides, and thrusting them into pockets which were so surprisingly capacious that they seemed to undermine his whole suit of clothes in every direction. These things looked so bad that Oliver was on the point of declaring his intention of seeking his way back, in the best way he could, when his thoughts were suddenly directed into another channel, by a very mysterious change of behaviour on the part of the Dodger. They were just emerging from a narrow court not far from the open square in Clerkenwell, which is yet called, by some strange perversion of terms, the Green, when the Dodger made a sudden stop, and, laying his finger on his lip, drew his companions back again, with the greatest caution and circumspection. "'What's the matter?' demanded Oliver. "'Hush!' replied the Dodger. "'Do you see that old cove at the bookstall?' "'The old gentleman over the way,' said Oliver. "'Yes, I see him.' "'He'll do,' said the Dodger. "'A prime plant,' observed Master Charlie Bates. Oliver looked from one to the other, with the greatest surprise, but he was not permitted to make any inquiries, for the two boys walked stealthily across the road, and slunk close behind the old gentleman, towards whom his attention had been directed. Oliver walked a few paces after them, and, not knowing whether to advance or retire, stood looking on in silent amazement. The old gentleman was a very respectable-looking personage, with a powdered head and gold spectacles. He was dressed in a bottle-green coat, with a black velvet collar, wore white trousers, and carried a smart bamboo cane under his arm. He had taken up a book from the stall, and there he stood, reading away, as hard as if he were in his elbow-chair in his own study. It is very possible that he fancied himself there indeed, for it was plain from his abstraction that he saw not the book-stall, nor the street, nor the boys, nor, in short, anything but the book itself, which he was reading straight through, turning over the leaf when he got to the bottom of a page, beginning at the top line of the next one, 
and going regularly on with the greatest interest and eagerness. What was Oliver's horror and alarm, as he stood a few paces off, looking on with his eyelids as wide open as they would possibly go, to see the dodger plunge his hand into the old gentleman's pocket and draw from thence a handkerchief, to see him hand the same to Charlie Bates, and finally to behold them both running away round the corner at full speed. In an instant, the whole mystery of the handkerchiefs, and the watches, and the jewels, and the Jew, rushed upon the boy's mind. He stood, for a moment, with the blood so tingling through all his veins from terror, that he felt as if he were in a burning fire. Then, confused and frightened, he took to his heels, and, not knowing what he did, made off as fast as he could lay his feet to the ground. This was all done in a minute's space. In the very instant when Oliver began to run, the old gentleman, putting his hand to his pocket, and missing his handkerchief, turned sharply round. Seeing the boy scudding away at such a rapid pace, he very naturally concluded him to be the depredator, and shouting, "'Stop, thief!' with all his might, made off after him, book in hand. But the old gentleman was not the only person who raised the hue and cry. The dodger and Master Bates, unwilling to attract public attention by running down the open street, had merely retired into the very first doorway round the corner. They no sooner heard the cry, and saw Oliver running, than, guessing exactly how the matter stood, they issued forth with great promptitude, and shouting, "'Stop, thief!' too, joined in the pursuit like good citizens. Although Oliver had been brought up by philosophers, he was not theoretically acquainted with the beautiful axiom that self-preservation is the first law of nature. If he had been, perhaps he would have been prepared for this. Not being prepared, however, it alarmed him the more. So away he went like the wind, with the old gentleman and the two boys roaring and shouting behind him. "'Stop, thief! Stop, thief!' There is a magic in the sound. The tradesman leaves his counter, the carman his wagon, the butcher throws down his tray, the baker his basket, the milkman his pail, the errand-boy his parcels, the schoolboy his marbles, the pavior his pickaxe, the child his battledore. Away they run, pell-mell, helter-skelter, slap-dash, tearing, yelling, screaming, knocking down the passengers as they turn the corners, rousing up the dogs, and astonishing the fowls, and streets, squares, and courts re-echo with the sound. "'Stop, thief! Stop, thief!' The cry is taken up by a hundred voices, and the crowd accumulate at every turning. Away they fly, splashing through the mud and rattling along the pavements. Up go the windows, outrun the people, onward bear the mob, a whole audience desert punch in the very thickest of the plot, and, joining the rushing throng, swell the shout, and lend fresh vigour to the cry, "'Stop, thief! Stop, thief!' "'Stop, thief! Stop, thief!' There is a passion for hunting, something deeply implanted in the human breast. One wretched, breathless child, panting with exhaustion, terror in his looks, agony in his eyes, large drops of perspiration streaming down his face, strains every nerve to make head upon his pursuers, and as they follow on his track, and gain upon him every instant, they hail his decreasing strength with joy. Stop, thief! Aye, stop him for God's sake, were it only in mercy. Stopped at last, a clever blow. He is down upon the pavement, and the crowd eagerly gather round him, each newcomer jostling and struggling with the others to catch a glimpse. Stand aside! Give him a little air! Nonsense! He don't deserve it. Where's the gentleman? Here he is, coming down the street. Make room there for the gentleman. Is this the boy, sir? Yes. Oliver lay covered with mud and dust, and bleeding from the mouth, looking wildly round upon the heap of faces that surrounded him, when the old gentleman was officiously dragged and pushed into the circle by the foremost of the pursuers. Yes said the gentleman, "'I'm afraid it is the boy.' "'Afraid?' murmured the crowd. "'That's a good un.' "'Poor fellow,' said the gentleman. "'He has hurt himself.' 
"'I did that, sir,' said a great lovely fellow, stepping forward, "'and preciously I cut my knuckle again his mouth. I stopped him, sir.' The fellow touched his hat with a grin, expecting something for his pains. But the old gentleman, eyeing him with an expression of dislike, looked anxiously round, as if he contemplated running away himself, which it is very possible he might have attempted to do, and thus have afforded another chase, had not a police officer, who is generally the last person to arrive in such cases, at that moment made his way through the crowd, and seized Oliver by the collar. "'Come, get up!' said the man roughly. "'It wasn't me, indeed, sir, indeed, indeed, it was two other boys,' said Oliver, clasping his hands passionately and looking round. "'They are, they are here somewhere.' "'Oh, no, they ain't,' said the officer. He meant this to be ironical, but it was true besides, for the Dodger and Charlie Bates had filed off down the first convenient court they came to. "'Come, get up.' "'Don't hurt him,' said the old gentleman compassionately. "'Oh, no, I won't hurt him,' replied the officer, tearing his jacket half off his back in proof thereof. "'Come, I know you. It won't do. Will you stand upon your legs, you young devil?' Oliver, who could hardly stand, made a shift to raise himself on his feet, and was at once lugged along the streets by the jacket-collar at a rapid pace. The gentleman walked on with them by the officer's side, and as many of the crowd as could achieve the feat got a little ahead, and stared back at Oliver from time to time. The boys shouted in triumph, and on they went. End of chapter 10